but the world's greatest threat to peace and life. brought to recognize they are the biggest factor in the world's disorder. And we must untangle the madness of their mind. The government of the People's Republic of China and the government of the United States have had great differences. We will have differences in the future. But what we must do is to find a way to see that we can have differences without being enemies in war. I knew nothing about China. Um, I remember when we got off the plane, it was like, like landing on the moon. This is a CBS News special report. The President in China. Banquet in the Great Hall. Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping, who spent most of today in Houston, arrived in Seattle tonight, where he'll spend the final two days of his American tour before returning to Peking Monday. Jim Laurie has been traveling with the Vice Premier and reports on Deng's activities in Texas. So the Chinese leave today with their memories and perhaps a new image for Communist China's leading man. For Deng Xiaoping not only went west, but went western. Dancing Girls in the Chinese production of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Bare breasts in the Impressionist art at Peking Airport. This merely symbolic of the liberalization in all areas of life. The Chinese fashion is, well, functional. Lots of blue cotton and an occasional People's Liberation Army great coat. <laughs> Enter fashion magnet Pierre Cartin, out to start a revolution of his own, evidently. He celebrated the idea in Peking with his idea of what the well-dressed Peking man and woman might wear in the future. In the markets, the reappearance of free enterprise, a relaxation of state controls, which extends to industry and agriculture as well. The early 80s, theme of China was, um, you know, Deng Xiaoping on a roll, opening up, isn't it great, Sino-U.S. Uh, love affair. An important part of the Chinese economy is the two-way trade with the United States, nearly six billion dollars worth this year. China's first international cosmetics exhibition. Thousands of would-be consumers, most of them young women, clogged the Beijing Exhibition Center marveling at the displays by foreign cosmetics companies, whose representatives were themselves marveling at the potentially huge market here. It's an unbelievable market, and with actually it will be the, the greatest market in the world. It is being called a massacre. Chinese troops have taken over Tiananmen Square by shooting and beating their way through thousands of demonstrators. The soldiers have now taken over Tiananmen Square. The protest there is finished, squelched. The images of the crackdown in Tiananmen Square were, were so searing that in so many people's minds, certainly outside of China, it became the overpowering image. An America that will not coddle tyrants from Baghdad to Beijing. Okay. Chairman Mao once wrote, a revolution is not a tea party, it is an act of violence. Today, even though the symbols of Mao's communist revolution still dominate China's political landscape, the country his successors defiantly hail as the last true bastion of socialism is undergoing a non-violent revolution, perhaps more profound than that which Mao himself inspired. <laughs> NBC guests and my NBC colleagues and grab them by the arm and say, I'm not going to believe what this was like just 20 years ago. 
You cannot believe this. That they've done this in this short amount of time is historic beyond my ability to describe it. What happens tonight is not merely a small step, but a great leap. China is welcoming the world. First ever Olympics for the world's most populous nation. They're expanding their army. They're obviously brutal people over there. They don't want any human rights. Uh, I think they have designs on uh, some more territory. The Peter's Republic of Capitalism, a four-night event, starting Wednesday, July 9th at 10, on the Discovery Channel. The city has already attracted significant American investment, like this Briggs and Stratton plant, where Chinese workers are now on the assembly line building American engines. Those engines used to be built here, at this shuttered Briggs and Stratton plant in Rolla, Missouri. These guys are after us and, and, uh, and, and, and looking for ways to, uh, uh, to, uh, to harm us. Tonight I'm announcing the creation of a trade enforcement unit that will be charged with investigating unfair trading practices in countries like China. There are 700 million Chinese don't today. Don't see it again. <laughs> and they are taught to hate. Their growing power is the world's greatest threat to peace and life. You can, you can see in that film that the sort of perceptions of China and the portrayal of China just lurch from one extreme to another, informed, of course, in part by things that did happen in China, but um, this, this difficulty in trying to get a more balanced uh, take on China um, is, is, I think, one of the big challenges for the media. And it's, it's reflected in, in public attitudes. I, I was looking uh, over the weekend. Uh, Literally 40 years to the day after Nixon arrived in Beijing, there was a, a Gallup poll which asked Americans, what country do you see as uh, the United States' greatest enemy? And Iran was number one, but number two was China, ahead, ahead even of my favorite place, North Korea, uh, with a quarter of the respondents saying that the Chinese were the greatest enemy. That same poll showed that four out of ten Americans had an unfavorable view of China, but that more than half of them had a positive view of China as a friendly country. So you have this sort of paradoxes within paradoxes uh, in the way in which people look at China. And what I hope we'll do in our discussion here is to try to talk a little bit about the, the, the origins of these different images and where the various flip-flops have come from and what they tell us both about China and about the way the media operates uh, and what we might need to think about in terms of trying to get a more balanced understanding of China uh, in our journalism and in our broader public understanding. And to do this, we've got a, a terrific panel of veteran uh, journalists uh, and uh, China hands, uh, just going down the row here. Uh, Marcus Broccoli is now the executive editor of the Washington Post and previously was the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, but I knew him back when he was a China hand in the 90s. He actually told me he first arrived in Hong Kong in the mid-80s and spent 15 years covering uh, greater China and, and, and the rest of the region based uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai for the Wall Street Journal, as well as stints uh, in Tokyo and in Europe. Uh, Jim Lorry, uh, who uh, chased Deng Xiaoping when he was wearing his cowboy hat, is a veteran foreign correspondent who spent many years at ABC and NBC News. He stayed in Saigon after the communist victory in 1975 and was the first ABC correspondent uh, to be based in Beijing after normalization and has covered China for many years and, and was there in 1989 and now runs his own video and consulting company and is currently working closely with China Central Television as it has just opened a big uh, North American production center here in Washington. Uh, Melinda Liu is the Beijing bureau chief for the Newsweek Daily Beast company and also a veteran China correspondent. She opened the Newsweek bureau. Beijing around the time that Jim opened the ABC Bureau, was also in Beijing uh, as I was in 1989 and after covering many other stories in other parts of the world including uh, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, both Gulf Wars I think, uh, 
and, and other things has been based in Beijing for the past several years. So she's seen it very early on, all the way up uh, to the present day. Uh, Jim Mann uh, is currently author in residence at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and previously served for many years as a correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, both as correspondent here as a foreign affairs columnist, and in the 1980s he was the LA Times Beijing correspondent. He's the author of a number of books uh, on, on China and on other uh, topics, including especially for purposes of this discussion, a book called The China Fantasy. Uh, and lastly, uh, Jerry Schechter is a journalist and historian with extensive experience uh, in China and Russia and in Southeast Asia. Uh, he worked uh, for the Wall Street Journal and spent 18 years with Time magazine and uh, covered the Nixon trip in 72 and again went to China with Nixon in uh, 1976. He also served in the Carter administration as Associate White House Press Secretary and National Security Council spokesman and is the author of nine books, if I have it right. That's, that's very impressive. Um, so I want to begin with you, Jerry. Co-authored. Uh, Co-authored, okay. Uh, still impressive. Uh, I want to begin with you and, 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 and ask if, if you would share a little bit the kind of uh, perception of China that you had as you got on the press plane to go to Beijing with Nixon in 72 and how the experience of being there altered both the way you looked at China and the way in which uh, you portrayed it in your coverage and the way in which time portrayed in its coverage. And time, of course, is interesting because it was uh, for many years uh, run by Henry Luce, the arch anti-communist supporter of John Kaishak and so forth. It was unbelievably exciting because I had been in the um, in the Hong Kong Bureau for Time Magazine from 1960 to 63, and um, it was like looking at China through a keyhole. We got our material on China from um, FBIS, the Federal Broadcast Information Service, which picked up. Um, radio broadcasts from inside China, translated them, and we devour them like uh, China sinologists, the way, same way as we've been covering um, the Soviet Union. And refugees would come through, uh, and the, the Catholic Church had a China-watching group with a great clergyman named Father Ladani, and he would put out a newsletter, which we would then use to, as, as trying to get material together for a story on China. So when we, when we arrived in, in, in Beijing, um, I, was on the, I was on the pool, uh, and uh, so I got to go on Air Force One. And uh, there was uh, Kissinger um, joking with uh, Zhao Guanhua, the, who was then the foreign minister, and the the tension was broken when Nixon stepped down the runway, s strode forth with his hand out, and shook hands with um, with Zhou Enlai, and that basically erased uh, the hard feelings that it existed since the Geneva Conference in 1954 when John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, refused to shake um, uh, Joe and Lai's hand. And what the first impression was how subdued the welcome was. Uh, there were no crowds on the streets and things were quiet. And Later, I, I, I recall contrasting to that the Chinese welcome uh, for Mrs. Buto when she arrived uh, on a, commemorating a new flight. There were people in costumes on the street waving, but the Nixon arrival was correct and I thought somber. Uh, we, got, we got to our hotel and we got a um, what I could only describe as a, a Chinese menu with an A list and a B list of what you wanted to do, where you wanted to go um, on the schedule. And 
you could go to the Nationalities House, or you could go to a Chinese hospital and watch a, an operation um, with, um, without anesthesia, or you could have acupuncture. And uh, uh, in those days, <laughs> acupuncture wasn't popular in the United States yet as an uh, alternative medicine uh, cure. And uh, I bravely put out my, my left hand, and uh, a man in a white coat twirled a, a thin needle um, between my thumb and forefinger, and wow, <laughs> that was, uh, you, you got a, a charge from that, and supposedly that was going to help you. Um, the, the, the banquets were spectacular, but there was no real news. And um, by the end of the week, I was getting desperate. And uh, uh, in Washington, one could often get to uh, Henry Kissinger and, and get, get a briefing if he wanted to tell you what, what, was go what was going on from his point of view. So in desperation, um, I had heard that, well, there's a new satellite system up here that we brought in a satellite for the for the visit, and um, it's easy to call Washington. So I dialed the White House operator, 202 uh, 1414, 245, I'm sorry, 456 1414, and uh, said, please connect me to Dr. Kissinger. And uh, Dr. Kissinger was in the guest house about five blocks away, <laughs> but uh, there was no way to get to him. So um, uh, the operator said, OK, please hold on. And um, she got back on the line a few minutes later and said, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Kissinger's not available. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, please ask him to call me back. I'm in room 301. Well, needless to say, uh, he never called back. But um, I, <laughs> I, I got a, a really good sense of how things had changed. I mean, in those days, um, it was 50 cents a word to, to send a, a, a cable from um, Hong Kong or, or China. And uh, the phone connections, you had to wait for, book your calls in advance, wait for a couple of hours, and the connections were terrible. Here, it was just like uh, the world had changed. And it, it had. Um, but there were no, there were, the, the, the whole purpose of the visit, it seemed to us, was um, not only to normalize diplomatic relations with, with China, but to uh, help Nixon's um, campaign for president and to show uh, who he, what he had really done. And the Chinese went all out for that. I mean, there was, we were totally corralled by our minders. Uh, there was no such thing as walking around Beijing on your own. Uh, and the, the impression was clearly one of a, of a totalitarian state, but well-disciplined people. Um, the, the porters, uh, the boy porters and the chambermaids wouldn't accept a tip. Tipping was uh, a capitalist practice that was banned in China, uh, we, were, we were told. And um, nobody could leave anything behind. The Chinese were, were very concerned that nothing be lost, um, even to the extent of um, one correspondent um, putting, uh, I think it was actually not a correspondent, uh, it was a White House staff member, had left a pair of underwear in, the, in her drawer, in her waste paper basket. And then as we were leaving, the, um, the, the porter came down and, and said, did you leave these behind? It was, it was an embarrassment, of course. We all laughed. But the, the point was that the, the, the Chinese didn't want to be accused of, of taking anything. Uh, that didn't belong to them. I see Ted Coppola sitting down there, and Ted got the only real scoop uh, 
uh, of the week when we went out to the Ming tombs, and he stayed behind to watch the, um, the Chinese families and people who had radios and picnic baskets. And while we, we'd all gone back to the hotel, Ted found that suddenly uh, the people uh, who were not wearing Mao, dull, dull uh, Mao jackets but had on nice, the children had on nice colored uh, clothes, and, and uh, they all got up, uh, tur- returned their radios, and climbed into a truck that, uh, that took, <laughs> took them all off, off uh, the, the stage set. Uh, later, um, after the, I think you, after you reported the story, Joe and Lai apologized, saying that that uh, was overdoing it a bit. So let me let me we'll, we'll, yeah. go, we'll come back to everybody, yeah. but uh, to a quick fast forward, Jim, you were on the you covered Dung's trip in '79, and and that to me seems to be one of one of these moments that stands out is as. You know, if you can identify a particular moment like the Nixon trip, where where something switched in terms of the Chinese perception. So, talk a little bit about the way in which Dung came across, and then the kind of narrative that informed the reporting when when you went and opened the bureau and were actually allowed to be based in Beijing. Well, to preface that, when Jerry was uh, in China, Ted was in China. I was in. Uh, oh, sorry, I was in uh, Vietnam. So we were, we were covering for NBC News at that time the lead-up to the spring offensive of 1972 in Vietnam. So fast forward, when I first went to China, it was 1978. In the mid-'70s, I had joined the Edgar Snow Society in uh, Hong Kong in the attempt, I thought, to curry favor with the Chinese in the hopes that they would give me a visa, which, of course, didn't work at all. Uh, but I did finally go in in 1978 to the uh, Canton Trade Fair, as it was then uh, known, and uh, I was disguised as a trader of porcelain when I first went in with a small a Super 8 camera uh, to do a first report for ABC News. Uh, and it's worth reflecting that in this period, from the Nixon visit up to the period when Deng Xiaoping comes back to power in uh, 1977 and then begins his reforms in 1978, the glimpses that the world had of China were very partial indeed. We had selective documentaries. Ted Koppel did one in 1974 called The People, The People's China. Uh, Michelangelo Antonioni in 1972 went into China and did a film which you have to have a great deal of patience to watch because it goes on for about four hours and it, uh, it, it basically focuses on uh, people standing in Tiananmen Square and in various other places, a film that was roundly denounced by the Chinese government at the time. And I was told later in Hong Kong, because of Antonioni, that was a reason why American and other television broadcasters would not be allowed to open up bureaus in China, because it portrayed the underdeveloped uh, country that China was at that time. Uh, 1978, uh, my first visit, Deng Xiaoping had, had, had come back uh, uh, to power uh, in Beijing, the four modernizations was the uh, was the code word, code words of of the time. You would, uh, as I did in in November of '78, uh, uh, drive through Shanghai and you'd have these great four modernization banners all over the country. And uh, I, I divide coverage of China in two periods, what I call the gee whiz period, which sort of begins in 1978 and is abruptly ended on June the 4th of 1989. And then there is nothing good about China period, which begins in 1989 and continues pretty much up through the Olympic Games and perhaps one can argue onward. So there's, uh, so I was in the gee whiz period of China. And part of the gee whiz was this character, Deng Xiaoping. There were about a dozen of us. Were you there, Melinda, in the Great Hall of People? There were a dozen of us invited to meet Deng Xiaoping in January, just after the full normalization of relations with China. And we all went in, sat in these uh, wonderfully overstuffed chairs with little white doilies on them, and Deng uh, sat before us uh, with his spittoon just to his left uh, and his chain smoking his uh, panda uh, cigarettes. And um, we... um, we then proceeded to try to ask questions, and it was somewhat disconcerting because every time we stood to ask a question, 
uh, Deng Xiaoping would um, expectorate into this spittoon next to him. And, uh, you know, Mike Oxenberg later, later told me that this was, a, this was quite a, a strategy that uh, Deng had to put off his, his, his foreign guests by continual spitting. Uh, after the session we had with Deng Xiaoping, uh, a, a, the, the, the foreign ministry chap uh, named uh, Yang Yahweh, 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 who is now out in Seattle, Washington, I believe. I, uh, anyway, he came to us, the, the three networks. In those days, there were only three networks, not the 2,000 there are today. Um, and came to us and said, in the interest of... Yuli Hatswa, in the interest of friendship and cooperation, would you agree to censor something? We all said, what? Censor? We don't censor. Well, the only thing we want you to do is not broadcast the shots of the spit coming from the vice premier's mouth into the spittoon. So, it, so we, we agreed to censor that. And it was never seen on television until Mike Chinoy discovered in the archives of ABC News, the spit, and has used it in the film that he has done of the history of U.S.-China relations. Um, later that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, actually many years later, it was an interesting contrast in how we perceived China. We, were, we agreed in 1979 to censor this incident. In 1989, when Deng Xiaoping was hosting Mikhail Gorbachev, there was a clip on China Central Television of Deng Xiaoping, by now in an advanced state of Parkinson's disease, shaking with his chopstick and unable to pick the food from his plate, and it drops down to his plate, and every network without question broadcast that image of Deng Xiaoping. These talk, visual images. Talk about the, the cowboy hat. The yeah, cowboy hat. That, that turned Deng into kind of the cuddly Indeed. communist. January 28th, Deng Xiaoping heads off to the United States, January 28, 1979. And it was covered like an American presidential uh, trip anywhere. There was a, a plane behind that had been chartered by the American media. Uh, all the networks were there, all the, 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 the major uh, magazines and newspapers. And the highlight was the visit to Houston, Texas. And uh, there was when Deng Xiaoping, I, I can't imagine uh, very many Chinese leaders, uh, or any leader, taking the risk of putting on a cowboy hat, getting in a stagecoach, and going around the uh, rodeo in uh, Houston, Texas. And uh, Deng, uh, Deng seemed to be, obviously, he was ultimately confident in his position at that, at, at that point. He then went to the Houston uh, Space Center, uh, the Johnson Spacecraft Center, and uh, asked the kind of questions that anybody would ask. His first question about uh, the astronauts uh, in terms of their spaceship was, where in these spaceships do you go to the toilet, he wanted to know. So uh, he, it was always characteristic in the little contact that we had with Deng Xiaoping of this remarkable uh, character, fearless individual, willing to do and say anything at virtually any time. And the media coverage was glowing, as I say. This was the gee whiz period. Um, I think Jay Matthews says in your film, you know, the lead of my Washington Post story at one point was, I shook hands with Deng Xiaoping. And it was, it was almost, you know, all the issues that we are consumed about today, issues of human rights, they were there, certainly, but they were put to one side as the coverage essentially was all about China opening up the new China. ABC News did a did an hour in January 1979 called New Beginnings uh, and anchored by Frank, the, the late Frank Reynolds. And there was this attitude of every story that I did in this early period, and when I opened the ABC Bureau in 1981, uh, uh, they were telling me from New York, we want the first. We want the first private restaurant, the first private car, the first... Uh, you know, all of these firsts, and so we were consumed by these wow, gee whiz stories. And that was the sense that we had reporting. And of course, we were very much limited. I will always remember the little travel permit that we were issued, which labeled us aliens, the alien travel permit, and the sign on the outskirts of Beijing in uh, Russian, English, Chinese, and French, 
which said no aliens or no foreigners beyond this point. And you didn't go beyond that point, usually in those days. But that's, that's a glimpse of the China that I first saw. And then before, I want to get to Melinda in 1989, but Jim, you were there in the mid-80s. So, and, and I knew you were your first book, because Beijing Jeep was about the, the early attempts by American companies to, who sort of saw the China market. Talk a little bit about that period in the sense of you know, the, kind of the portrayal of China, the, the image of China that the people were getting. Very much as... Very much as Jim said, and, and more so, um, I would go a bit further, and I would say that there were ways in which this gee whiz image of China furthered America's strategic and military interests. I mean, this was the period when uh, the United States was working with, with China to deal with the Soviet Union, and uh, the, the extent that um, there were human rights issues or issues of political repression um, really, the U.S. government was not particularly interested in, in uh, hearing them um, or dealing with them. Uh, I can remember that uh, at one point, I, it was the 10th anniversary of Mao's death in 86. I did, I think, three, a three-part series on where China was, and part of it was Deng's reforms, and one part of it was continuing political repression. A couple months later, Mike Wallace came to Beijing preparing to interview Dung, and you know, I had a lunch with him. You know, tell, and he, I tried to tell him, um, look, this, you know, this place is not opening up politically as well as economically as in the way that people back in the states think. Uh, and um, he didn't take it up. About uh, two or two or three years after Tiananmen, I talked to. I was by then back in Washington talked to friends in China working for television stations, and they said, you know, every time a visiting correspondent comes in, um, it's uh, take us to the repression. So it, things had completely flipped. And the embodiment, the single anecdote that, that brought it home to me, um, very much my, the, the um, conventional wisdom which I was uh, brought in with is exactly what Jerry says. You know, if you stay in a um, Chinese hotel, the room attendants um, are so kind and nice that they will return your used ra razor blades to you, which, you know, was true. It wasn't the whole truth. Uh, and lo and behold, I went on what was the single most hostile diplomatic exchange between the United States and China. That was Warren Christopher's trip to Beijing in um, 1994. Uh, and I was stunned because before we landed, the security officials on the plane brought the the correspondent, you know, just were kind of briefing the correspondents, don't leave anything in your room because the room attendants are all spies. And I said, oh, well, you know, <laughs> it's probably the same room attendants. <laughs> and, you know, it's a little bit above. They're not all spies, and they weren't all razor blade returners uh, in, the, in the 70s either. Um, what had changed was American attitudes. And, and just one last thing, um, the role of the when we talk about media, there's a difference uh, between the correspondents in, in Beijing, Shanghai, in China, and the visitors. And a lot of the images came from back in the States, uh, both ways. That is, you know, gee whiz, China, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, China as total repression. Both um, are dictated, not dictated, that would be the wrong word, but are encouraged by what uh, people back in the States, whether, whether it's um, TV producers, anchors, um, uh, newspaper editors, you, you could see um, people wanting that story, you know, the first China goes disco, uh, or, um, or, you know, China is, China is putting everybody on trial even when that's beginning to slack off. Um, so when we talk about the media impressions of China, actually remarkably little of it, I think, um, is set by the actual correspondents in Beijing who are, or, or in, in China, who are reporting China day to day, week to week, month to month quite well. Melinda's been doing it for years. <laughs> the, the, obviously the critical turning point, and in some ways still have, still at some level, shapes or informs the whole discussion on China is, is 1989. I mean, 
the man in front of the tank is one of those images that is uh, my old professor at Yale, Jonathan Spence, said, uh, you know, the June 19, June 4, 1989 is a date that's going to haunt authoritarian governments in China for centuries, which I thought was an interesting observation. And it's certainly been a central feature at some level, a lot of the discussions. Talk a little bit, I mean, you were there, as I was, for, for a lot of that, um, about the experience and the extent to which it sort of shattered il th this il image or that had built up too much of the aid. I remember in 1984, Reagan, President Reagan went to China and he talked about China's so-called communists. And there was this sense that the Chinese were becoming like us. They were going capitalist. They were eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. They were going to discos and so on. And then suddenly this whole other side that had been forgotten about or ignored or kind of off in the corner he emerged in, in a very, very brutal, shocking way. So, you know, you're, yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that the events of spring 1989, uh, while we're talking about flip-flops in perception, um, provided perhaps the most dramatic flip-flop from a benign image to a terrible image for China. You know, it, you know, if the Nixon trip were the opposite, you know, something, you know, something that was weird and evil um, turning out to be maybe someone that, that the United States could partner with, um, I think the, the crackdown on the protests in Tiananmen Square in June 1989 was a shocking and stunning um, reassessment and reversal of what had been a, a largely po positive image of China. Um, why was it so overwhelmingly positive? Uh, I think partly because, as some of my colleagues have pointed out, partly it was because we saw a population that seemed very alien and very different, communist, um, you know, wearing no bright clothes and, you know, becoming more like Americans, more like us. And that's got to be great, right? That's got to be good. Um, it had been, uh, there had been no private markets, no private sector to speak of economically. Suddenly, private markets, people are buying and selling things. Entrepreneurs were starting their own uh, little businesses. Of course, in those days, the businesses were repairing bicycle tires. You know, today, the businesses are, you know, building gigantic social media companies that, that <laughs> list for amazing amounts of money on, you know, on, on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, good, becoming more like us. But what, what, we, what I think all of us uh, in America uh, s sort of fail to adequately appreciate is that, that the complexities of China were, were not something you could stereotype into something very simple. It was a really complex nation, complex government, bureaucracy, and a very complex people. Um, in fact, these days, I, I think China is more like five different countries. And when you try to cover it, uh, being based in China, it's almost like a, 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 a person with a split personality, you know, the, the five faces of Eve, except it's China. Um, <laughs> I don't think we adequately appreciate that because going into the spring of 1989, what was the big story? Well, first of all, we, you know, as we heard, uh, you know, there had been all these um, dismantling of the people's communes in favor of private, family-run farms, and isn't that great? You know, the the first uh, uh, the first disco, the first, you know, it, all of those. Um, Wonderfully upbeat stories that we all covered. You know, I, I covered the, the dis, you know, a, a people's commune that was being dismantled, and literally, you know, one family was overjoyed because they had there had been a wheelbarrow that had been communally owned and communally used, and this family was getting the wheel of it, and the rest of it was going to another family, and they were like, "This is our wheel," you know. I'm like, oh, how are you gonna? but anyway, um, the big story that we all expected in the spring of 1989 was not a pro-democracy protest movement spontaneously generated by, you know, thousands and thousands of people. It was 
the historic visit by Mikhail Gorbachev to China, ending three decades of, of Sino-Soviet um, uh, rivalry and estrangement. Um, and again, you know, it was, it, it sort of fit. It was sort of easy to, to see the geostrategic importance of this. Um, what we totally ignored was what was going on internally in China. A lot of corruption, a lot of public dissatisfaction, overall uh, a very high level of inflation, which was creating a lot of dissatisfaction among people, uh, just ordinary people. And so I, I remember uh, having an exchange with my editors in New York because, of course, we were preparing this gigantic package on Sino-Soviet relations and Gorbachev coming and all this stuff. And I said, well, you know, there's, um, there are these small demonstrations that are going on around Beijing. And it's, it's not totally unprecedented, but they're bigger than they used to be. They're more persistent. And, um, and this was like maybe a week and a half before Gorbachev arrived. And I said, you know, they're, they're significant. Maybe we should do a story as part of our package because you know, this is unusual. And uh, one of my editors, in his wisdom, said, nah, just fold it into the running story. You know, it's just a sidebar, right? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, then, then the magazine went to bed, and then, uh, you know, by Monday, um, <laughs> the protests were huge. You know, the Gorby visit, to the extent that there was anything going on, it, you know, was still about, you know, about the protests themselves. Um, everyone got caught flat-footed. I mean, all the, all the media that had, you know, more than a day or two of lead time were all talking about geostrategic uh, implications. And meanwhile, the real story was out there in the streets. And I don't know if you recall this, but, you know, Gorbachev, uh, it was pretty obvious that there was going to be some kind of clash here of, of um, expectations, because Gorbachev would normally have been welcomed with huge pomp and ceremony, you know, gigantic welcoming uh, reception at the, at the airport and uh, Great Hall of the People and reviewing the Honor Guard in the Tenement Square. None of that could take place. He was literally sneaked in, you know, through back, back entrance into the Great Hall of the People. Um, a visit to the Forbidden City was canceled because they can't get to the Forbidden City because there are just so many protesters in the square. And I remember I... I sort of calculated that if Gorby's visit was going to go the way it was supposed to go, or something similar to the way it was supposed to go, um, the Chinese authorities would have to clear the square the night before he arrived. So I actually, I, I, I just assumed they would. So I said, oh, I'll get this story. I'll just stay all night in the square. And I did. <laughs> waiting and waiting and waiting. And I just remember, you know, the next day the sun came up and you know, all, I called them rebel flags. You know, the demonstrators had put up flags on the official flagpoles in the square, and they were all flapping and colorful. And um, I just thought, oh, my God, you know, how is this, how is this going to possibly work? And, of course, they did get some diplomacy done in the end, but it, it, um, the, the Soviet retinue itself was very much... In, uh, transfixed by what was going on around them, all the chaos, all the last-minute changes, and it was a huge loss of faith for the Chinese who were hosting this. And um, again, the fact of the protests fed into a, another kind of perception of, uh, American perception of China, which was Oh, my goodness, this is surprising, and they're becoming even more like us. You know, now they're pro-democratic -demo people in the streets, you know, they're pro-democracy. And, of course, it, it, I think it is accurate to say that, that there were many protests that were pro-democracy -de protests. I, I think even more so they were anti-corruption protests, they were um, anti-nepotism protests, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with... Uh, what people perceive to be um, abuses of power by, by government leaders and whatnot. And also, I don't think Chinese had really a good understanding what democracy is. And for, in fact, I spoke with a Chinese woman, and I remember this very much, very, very vividly. She, she, she said to me, I don't know what democracy is, but China needs more of it. <laughs> you know, in other words, it was this yearning... Um, 
sort of amorphous, and there was a strong tendency on the side of editors to um, sort of, uh, again, uh, sim simplify what the what the student leaders of these protests um, wanted and how they were going to get it, and um, and what America's role should be. Uh, I, I remember having several conversations of you know where the question was, well, how how can we Americans help help the students win? And I said, well, win what? You you you, <laughs> you want the People's Republic of China to be ruled by you know 19 year old Wu um, but you know the the idea of of uh, a grassroots uprising like that um, being able to be organized um, I think was again a very very bad misperception on our part so so when 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 the tanks rolled in and people were killed and it was all on television which accentuated it all um, I mean, that, that just totally, in a, in a stroke, changed the view of China. Overnight. The, butcher, the cuddly communists became the butchers of Beijing. Overnight. I, I Overnight. Actually, a, a, a mild dissent on that. It wasn't all on television. If it was all on television, the reactions would have been much worse. A lot, a lot of it was on television. Well, not the, not the actual shootings uh, east of the square. But, uh, west of the square. But but then but sorry but to to, pe to just just to to jump to jump forward you 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 were started following China in the mid '80s but you were based in Shanghai in the mid '90s right mid late '90s right so you sort of came in afterwards and sort of were picking up on the sort of post Tiananmen economic boom uh, and that that emer so talk a little bit both about how that emerged as a central narrative and where the Kind of ghosts of Tiananmen continued to hover in terms of shaping the reporting and, and, and the way in which people would have looked at China at that point? Um, well, first of all, uh, I think it's interesting to listen to the comments of, the, of Jim and, and Jerry about the early days of U.S. coverage of China because it's, it's very anecdotal and there was a lot a lot of freight that traveled with each story of, you know, seeing, seeing one glimpse of something became a perception about a whole country. And, and when you listen to um, Jim Mann and Melinda talk, you, you see that there's, there starts to be more and more depth of information. And, you know, journalists can be very reductive. We have to be somewhat reductive to convey information to audiences that, you know, are maybe trying to understand something far away, but really you're and so you try to simplify it. Um, but as more and more information becomes available, it gets harder and harder to be really reductive and be effective. And um, Jerry mentioned the, this uh, Jesuit group in Hong Kong, Father Ladani, used to collect information on China in, in the early 80s. When I first came to Hong Kong, actually, he was still doing it. And they would do things like they would, they would go to the Kowloon Railway, Railway Station and they'd look at the trains that brought vegetables in from Guangdong province and they'd examine the grease on the axles of the trains to try and get some understanding of what the petrochemical industry in China was up to and how it was doing. I mean, really. And, and this was not, this was even after, even after um, normalization. But by the time, by today, you know, if, if you went to China, I don't know this, but I guess you probably would find reporters who work for Bloomberg who just cover the petrochemical industry in China, and you would probably find people who work for Petroleum News. And, you know, I would, when I first went to Hong Kong in 1984, I was covering Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, and the Philippines, and I was one person for a news service then. Um, today, that news service has something like 100 people in China, including people who translate news from Chinese and people who translate news into Chinese. So there's vastly more information. And in spite of there being vastly more information, what I find most interesting is the challenge we all have still in, in eradicating or, or eliminating misperceptions. I mean, I think it's probably an impossible task. And the, the question is, why is it that, that misperceptions persist in spite of there being such vast amounts of information? I think that the answer is that the answer lies somewhat in how journalists do their job and in the way people read information and connect to information in faraway places. I think, in essence, what journalists do, and their editors do it too. I hear a lot of criticism of editors up here, and it's you know, <laughs> <laughs> you you put information into certain frameworks that people understand, and 
If you look at China in the last, um, in the last 20 or 30 years, there are certain frameworks that, that survive, certain understanding that survive. Like the notion that China is a megalith, this, this one giant, you know, centrally controlled place. You'll see China described in, in reputable newspapers as, as a totalitarian state, which reflects a true misunderstanding of what a totalitarian state is. China is more of a free-for-all economy than a free market economy. It's a, it's a very chaotic place today. Um, you know, obviously, there are, there are still China is still described as a communist country, which is, as somebody here said, it's nominally true that China is a communist country, but depends on how you define communism, what you know, what your reading of Marx was or Lenin was. Um, people have tried to address it. The journalists have tried to address that in their coverage. Nick Kristof used to refer to China, I think it was he who first did, as a market Leninist economy. Was that was that Kristof? Um, you know, when I was at the Wall Street Journal, we actually got in the habit of calling it nominally communist and explaining what we meant because we were trying to, you know, we didn't want to be accused of, of not appreciating that the Communist Party was ruling, but ruling the country. But we, on the other hand, it's clearly wasn't engaged in anything that would resemble communism as as created by Marx. Um, China was also described and is described still as a as a mercantilist state. Um, and I think that was a that was a concept that was framed in part by Japan, that. People, as, as China grew more and more economically successful and prosperous, the understanding Americans had of Japan seemed convenient to apply to the country next door because it's all in Asia and they surely are behaving in the same way. Clearly, you know, China wasn't behaving in the same way, it wasn't, maybe is do, doing more so, but wasn't behaving in the same way that Japan did. Um, they were, you know, their, their idea of international trade was very different from Japan's idea of international trade. Their idea of foreign investment was radically different from Japan's idea of foreign investment, but it was a convenient metaphor. And I think one that, if you saw that Mitt Romney clip, I think that's still the idea that uh, prevails today. Um, then, of course, there's the more recent description of China as a capitalist society, which is also kind of true, but kind of not true, because, of course, it's state capitalism, as it's now described, and state capitalism is not capitalism as we know it, and it tends to overlook all the elements of corruption and all the distortions in the system. And then there are all the, the more recent interesting depictions of China, frameworks of understanding China as a sort of, as a imperial power, which it is giving signs of being in some ways, um, but not just politically, not just militarily, but in terms of its culture and its art, and, um, and in most, most pointedly and importantly, in terms of its wealth and how it deploys its wealth to advance uh, its interests. And all of these things, each one of these things is a separate framework for trying to explain China to an American audience. And each one of them is partly right and partly not right. And you can never, unless you write a book like Jim Mann's, and I commend all of his books, which are extraordinary, but if you, unless you really get into um, great nuance and detail, unless you have an audience that cares a lot, it's, it is hard to convey everything in, the, in the sufficient depth to really give people a full understanding of a place that, as Melinda said, is, is you know, extremely complicated today. I want to open it up to the audience because um, we've, we've still got some time, and this is a big panel, and if we go around again, it'll be almost uh, time to finish. And uh, I'd like to ask Ted Koppel, who went on the Nixon trip and, and then many years later did The People's Republic of Capitalism, that wonderful uh, piece for discovery, if you have any thoughts about, you know, how journalists can somehow come to grips with, I mean, the, because the problem that today in China, it's, as Melinda does, it's so complicated, it's so diverse, it so doesn't lend itself to an 800-word article, a two-minute spot on the evening news, that it's really hard to capture the essence of what's going on, um, and, and I think it creates a real problem for journalists who are trying to do that. Sure, sure. I think we're always about 10 years behind. Uh, we're, we're clearly 10 years behind. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just saying, I think we're always about 10 years behind in, in our perceptions of China. Um, it, it strikes me as particularly interesting that um, for all of us who were over there in 1972 and all of the reporting that went on, very little, almost nothing was written at the time about the Cultural Revolution which was, at that time, the dominant reality of China. Uh, it strikes me as equally interesting that, that these days, uh, as we look at China and as we denounce, um, somewhat tepidly, I think, uh, the way they crack down on human rights, uh, 
that very, very little is written about the, the continuing reality of China's self-perception, and that is the thing most to be feared is chaos. Uh, and whatever is required to keep China from falling into chaos is legitimate. Uh, that answers a lot of what's going on in Tibet. It answers a lot of what the Chinese support for Syria today means. Uh, and yet there's very, very little reporting on that, certainly in, in, in my industry in television, that it goes on. Anyone else have? Yes. Just identify yourself. And... <coughs> Joe Bosco, I'm a consultant formerly with the Defense Department. I'm intrigued by your description of the so-called gee whiz period, where there was uh, seemed cooperation between both the American media and the American government not to dwell on human rights issues and that kind of uh, problem within China. And my question is, is it possible, is it conceivable that Deng Xiaoping and his people knew that, and therefore when they had to make the fateful decision on June 4th, 1989, they made the calculation that we can get away with this as long as we keep on with the economic development. Um, well, Jim and then Melinda. Well, uh, two answers that cut in different directions, I guess. The first is, um, yes, they they would have known that the United States was you know was not going to uh, respond. Uh, in any major way, um, they had they had established a long relationship with um, with several administrations, as everybody at this conference has said. Uh, but secondly, I would say also that it wouldn't have mattered that it was not that they were doing what they what Dung, some of the people, not all of the Chinese leaders, obviously not Zhao Ziang, thought had to be done. Um, and I don't I really think that was uh, entirely. Um, domestically motivated, that I don't think the U.S. was a factor. I, I agree very much. Um, quite frankly, I think what will Washington think if we crack down was perhaps at the very, very bottom of the list of priorities. You know, what was going on here was, a, was um, yes, uprising in the street, but most importantly, uh, a power struggle in, in the corridors of power, and um, Deng Xiaoping, as cute and cuddly as he appeared with, you know, the cowboy hat and everything like that, the, these guys have been cutting each other's throats for decades, and, the, it, it, you know, this was um, the sort of thing that was going on, uh, you know, within the Communist Party for a long, long time, um, and, and indeed not, you know, that, that sort of uh, reaction is not restricted to China. Um, it's it's something that came very naturally, given that Deng was already, um, it, it would now appear, uh, in a, you know, so elderly that, that some of the information that was reaching him was perhaps being selectively filtered by different factions, and he was possibly making decisions based on um, a, a, not a comprehensive understanding of what was going on. The, the, was, his, power, his power base was the army, and and he had the support of, of the army, and he he probably would have lost it had he not had he not made that decision and gone along with with the repression. But it's which, true, which is but not to which is not not to um, apologize for it uh, for him, but but it was a. a, a Difficult internal decision, but again, as far as the United States influence, I, I think it, it it didn't it didn't matter because what did matter was was uh, control uh, in China, and in fact, uh, you know, a month later, Bush sent um, Scowcroft and Eagleburger to, um, to to say let's let's move on. If I could just add one thing on that incident and the American relationship, Bush. Uh, uh, did try to call Dung in those days before the final crackdown. Uh, and um, Dung didn't take the call. The call didn't go through, which is usually interpreted half right as, you know, 
I don't want to hear whatever he has to say. I don't want to hear it. Um, but it also, was also his way of preserving a relationship with, I mean, he didn't, he didn't want to hear it, and he didn't want to have an argument about it. He just wanted, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yes, in the corner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful panel. And I'm a graduate student at Georgetown University. Uh, my name is James Chan, and uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Mike uh, Chong. And I know that you work uh, in China for a long time, and I've actually have reading your books so two decades in the heart of Dragon, but I've, that's been over two years. So it's available on Amazon.com. Yeah. Right? And uh, <laughs> well, um, actually, in a, in a, there's a lot of changes happening in China, and I was wondering, what biggest changes do you think in terms of the working environment for foreign journalists in China today compared to um, over there as the Bureau Chief in Beijing? Thank you. Well, I should, I, I, Melinda, who's resident there now, should add to this. But my, I, I would say certainly compare with the Nixon trip, it's night and day. I mean, Dan, Dan Rather, whom I interviewed for this film, I did, talked about how it was a major a major production for him and his crew to sneak out of the Minzu Hotel and get around the corner and try and take some video in a shop before the minders came in and said, no, you have to go back to the hotel. Today, with the exception of Tibet and parts of Xinjiang, the Chinese government's own rules allow foreign journalists to travel freely. It's much easier to talk to people. Uh, China, it's much easier to have personal relationships and friendships with Chinese people to go to their homes. I mean, I remember when I moved to Beijing in 1987, it was a big deal when it was decided that Chinese could go to the disco of the Great Wall Sheraton Hotel, which had previously been foreigners only. So the interaction with China as a society is much easier, and China itself is a much more open society with the Internet opening amazing doors just in terms of understanding things going on. That being said, it's still very difficult, and particularly on sensitive stories, and a lot of people in local areas, even though the government, central government rules say you can talk to them, local officials don't let you. There are lots of cases of reporters being harassed and beaten. So it's a mixed bag, but if you take a step back and look at where it was 40 years ago, where it is today, it's, it's vastly better. I don't know if you have anything more to yeah, add to I, that. Yeah, I, I would, yeah, just, um, just a couple of thoughts. I would, I would agree with Mike. Um, definitely compared to when I opened the Newsweek Bureau in 1980 and 82, you know, just dramatic improvement in terms of access, uh, people's willingness to talk, even government officials' willingness to talk, you know, for a time it was, I wouldn't say common, but it was possible, you know, to have a casual off-the-record dinner with a vice premier and, you know, exchange views. However, since the Olympics in, in 2008, um, I have to say things have gone back again, and, and a little bit. Um, and this, is a, this, again, is a pattern that we've seen throughout the decades. It, I'm confident that they'll go forward again at some point. But there has been a bit of backward slippage. Um, and it's very interesting, again, it's not what you think of the big bad government of China you know, cracking down on foreign media. It's not so simple as that. It seems to be that the the central government is still on board, and indeed, sometimes when journalists get in sticky situations in in the grassroots, um, the foreign ministry is there is the one that helps get them out of it. But it's the local authorities now who are trying to protect their interests, um, whose maybe whose jobs and whose bosses' promotions rely on not having protests getting out of hand. And just very recently. Um, mid-February, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China sent out a, a, a message to members um, saying such and such a Dutch journalist was beaten up yesterday by a group of thugs and men who appeared to be plainclothes policemen in the village of Panha, Zhejiang province, while covering the recent uprising against local party officials. Now, what was weird about this is that this foreign journalist at one point was in the company of foreign affairs officials at, at the grassroots. Um, the car was stopped. The journalist was taken away from the foreign affairs officials by these guys who beat them up and then given back to them. And um, the foreign affairs officials were not necessarily happy about this beating up thing, but they were also powerless to stop it. So you can see how complicated this is. These are two groups of government officials who weren't weren't on the same page and indeed probably had very different views about how to resolve that situation. 
um, with a journalist caught in the middle. And, and that's increasingly the case where local fiefdoms now are trying to protect their interest. And so you, you can, very often you get in the middle of different levels of bureaucracy. So then, wow, a lot of people. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I'm Barbara Pillsbury, working in China and since 1978 in health and population. Um, Melinda, would you mind commenting on your experience as a Chinese American and how the Chinese uh, populace and the Chinese government has reacted toward you as a Chinese American in terms of greater access, more restricted access, higher expectations, etc.? Um, sure. I think it balances out in the end. Um, I would be lying if I were to say it didn't make a difference that I'm a Chinese American. It does make a difference. I think certainly if I were in a crowd, I wouldn't stick out as much as a Caucasian, obviously. So there, um, there might be some situations where I can slither around and maybe talk to some people uh, more easily than if I were obviously a foreigner. But on the other hand, there are also um, situations where it's not, an, it's not an advantage to be ethnically Chinese. If I, and I, this has happened to me, if I'm covering an anti-government protest in ethnic minority areas, Xinjiang or Tibet, I'm, I, you know, I appear to be Chinese, and so, uh, you know, a Tibetan with grievances against you know, um, sort of the sinicization of their culture and their, their um, neighborhoods would not necessarily open up to me, whereas if I were Caucasian, they might. And I, I very vividly remember actually um, going to Tibet as part of a government-sponsored trip in 1980. And for Tibetans, this was amazing, you know, to see foreigners. And they, they were stuffing papers into people's pockets. Uh, with their stories, um, all kinds of stories, cultural revolution stories and whatnot. And um, I, I got my share of them as well, but I, I definitely didn't get as many as some of the Caucasian, you know, blonde-haired Caucasian guys. You know, literally, we'd, we'd come back from walking around and there'd be all these papers, you know, just stuck into our pockets by people who wanted to get their story to, to foreign journalists. Um, the government is, the Chinese government, I think, is very quite sophisticated these days about dealing with um, Chinese Americans or, or um, foreign nationals of, of Chinese as 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 you may know the the current um, American ambassador to to Beijing is um, Gary Locke and he's ethnically Chinese and uh, there are some expectations like oh you know you must understand China better because you're overseas Chinese but um, I think in general they know that that ambassador is there to protect the interests of the United States. And, and by the same token, you know, me as an American journalist, um, they, they, they do understand that I have my job to do. And uh, um, so I, I think it's sort of, it, in, the, in, the, in the big picture, it just sort of evens out. I don't think I have a leg up or, or a, a, a horrible disadvantage either. Right, I've been told only one more question. Unfortunately, why don't we take you there? Yes. Uh, I'm Sven Kramer. Um, it seems to me that the story that we heard that the Gorbachev um, retinue was transfixed by what it saw uh, takes us to what happened in 1889 in the fall in Eastern Europe where Gorbachev refused the orders, the requests of the East European authorities, sometimes heads of state, party leaders, to shoot uh, against those crossing the Czech-Hungarian border against those going at the wall. And the cost of Gorbachev's not shooting, perhaps scared by what he had seen as a result in China, uh, cost him, cost the Soviet Union its, its empire. Because in a, whether you call it totalitarian or authoritarian dictatorship, whatever, one party state, if you don't shoot, you're going to lose. Because the, the water drains out of the bathtub, the water of authority, when you cannot suppress. So now dealing with the Uyghurs or the uh, Tibetans, um, or any rising protests in China in the future, my own guess is that the Tiananmen situation would 
come up again and that the authorities would be faced with the choices they had in 89 or that Gorbachev had. And it, it, it is a very difficult thing to foresee what they would or would not do. Uh, and it seems to me that one of the things that all of us ought to be concerned about is that the Chinese government works towards the transition towards a more democratic, multi-voice, even possibly multi-party state in order to avoid those kind of ways of resolving the obvious gaps in China that are there within the population and, and the non-Han people as well. So what, how do you foresee this future crisis of that sort, an internal crisis being resolved by what is still a single party state that has not made uh, a political discourse and competition anywhere near the priority that it probably should be if it wants to avoid this kind of situation I've just portrayed. Why don't I, why don't I uh, sort of a expand on that a little bit since you're asking about sense of how China would deal with the future crisis to talk, ask everybody very quickly in a minute to just talk ab about um, sort of how they see the way in which we cover China more generally and, and in terms of trying to address both the coverage of a situation like that and the kind of image that Ch China's going to have going going forward. Why don't we start at this end and just go down the... I'm not sure I'm qualified to say how they would react. I mean, it's been a long time since I've been there, and I'm sure Melinda will have more recent ideas on it. Um, we obviously, you know, for a readership that includes Washington and, and people in power in the United States, we pay close attention to how China's government evolves, and I think, I think we... What we try to do is anticipate the news by explaining, um, by exploring the nature of the government and the people who are running the government better. And then if you understand who they are and how they think, we might be able to anticipate it. I mean, I, I will, and with that, I will just defer to people who, who may be closer to the, the, the government and the situation today. I think first it's worth noting that the public security apparatus today in China is far greater and far more extensive than it was in 1989. The amount of money, and you can see this in the recent uh, National People's Congress statistics that they spend on internal security, is extraordinary. They've also become more sophisticated. The biggest question that we used to ask in 89 is, why not tear gas? Why not rubber bullets? Why not something? Why something other than live ammunition? Well, today, uh, they have bought all of that. Today, they are utilizing all of that in every province of the country. So they have the apparatus for uh, demonstration crowd control that was not in existence in 1989. Uh, in terms of the future of coverage of China, uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up on, um, on something that Marcus said earlier, and I wasn't sure that he was uh, referring to uh, television. But I think that we're always going to have little snapshots, and we're always going to have little anecdotes, and we're never going to have uh, the comprehensive picture of China that perhaps uh, all of you deserve and all of us want. Um, I think your very good question about the ethnic um, unrest, and it, it is a serious problem. Uh, Again, paradoxically, because we've been talking a lot about um, very tragic incidents of the past, there have been situations defused, if maybe only for a temporary period of time, but defused by much more sophisticated and much less heavy-handed policies by um, people who I, could, I would identify as more um, progressive Chinese officials. Uh, Party Secretary of Guangdong Province, for example, has has been praised recently for uh, diffusing a, a, a pretty pretty stubborn protest um, situation in one of his cities. So that's that's maybe something that you know again in our in our tendency to simplify and stereotype or perceive in a certain way that maybe we haven't appreciated um, totally. Um, in terms of broader perceptions going forward of China, what where I think there's a real a possibility for um, miscalculation and uh, missed, um, sort of missed signals between both sides is the fact that even as many Americans tend to uh, 
see China as this rising threat, this muscular dragon, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there was a Gallup poll in February that where 53 percent of Americans consider China to be the world's top economic power. Weirdly, the Chinese don't see themselves that way. The Chinese perceive themselves to be much weaker. Um, one of the leading newspapers in China, the Global Times, in December 2011, when asked whether China had become a world power, only 14 percent of Chinese said yes. So we get this, this headline like this, where they're saying, hey, you know, Americans don't get us. And what they're saying is the reality is we're much weaker, much, much more screwed up, much more uh, dysfunctional than what you think. And um, I think there, there is a uh, possibility for um, things getting lost in tra translation because a lot of Americans would think, oh, you know, China's this rising muscular power, and the Chinese don't necessarily see that, always see themselves as, you know, uh, they, they don't necessarily always act as an arrogant empire. There are still some officials who say, we don't want to be an empire. We've been there, done that, done it many times. Didn't work. Wasn't good for us. So we, you know, they don't want to be um, perceived in that way. Jim, um, I'd say in in response to Mr. Bosco's question that in a way we we are already seeing um, what China's uh, strategy and approach will be. That is, um, this is now you know, decades after Tiananmen and technology has advanced. Um, uh, at the time of Tiananmen, uh, China was able to station security people at uh, fax machines uh, in ar around major cities to make sure there wasn't, weren't faxes coming in and out. Well, that's so much ancient history. Um, and now they're worried about cell phones. Uh, and sh as, you know, we just saw in the domestic political context um, that uh, Romney's campaign tried to do a, in Detroit a, a Mike Deaver and line up the perfect television coverage, and they missed the fact that there were going to be cell phones to show how few people there were there. Well, um, what I think they're really not worried about television coverage. They're worried about the fact that people have cell phones uh, and, and that any crackdown will be broadcast. So what, what we're seeing is a two-pronged strategy. The first... Um, which we saw immediately after the Arab Spring, uh, is never to allow those protests to develop, to stop them before they start, uh, to make sure that there are not large crowds gathering, because that inherently um, creates a, a different situation. And so, they, yeah, they, I think that seems to me to be one good reason why, uh, for, um, in their terms, why they've cracked down so severely after the Arab Spring. And I'm, then the, I'm, I'm, I have to, yeah. I'm, I'm told that ne they run a very tight ship here. They're told the next event is starting already. So do you okay. have 30 seconds worth yeah, of Yeah, no, the, and the other... And the, Jerry have 30 seconds, and then we'll... No, I'll, I'll, I'll 15 seconds. The, right. the second part of the strategy is this, they, they cut off cell phones. I mean, they did this in, in Xinjiang um, a couple years ago. So that's, if you get... You know, they have a, a whole series of things. What happens when you get protests developing, which is cut off social media? Jerry, 30 seconds. I, I think they, they've got to, they can't cut off the Internet, and they're going to have to give way to public opinion on, on many issues. Not the least of the things that fascinated me was that thousands of people left money in front of the artist was it out on I the way, way, way. Uh, house so that he could pay a tax bill that everybody said was it was a phony um, in, in a society like China where, where it is growing and rising um, there, there has to be change and uh, we have to press for it well, thank you very much. I think the one final word on this is China is complicated and is a challenge for all of us to try and figure it out and present it. Thank you all. Okay. Oh, 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 ok
You are James Chan. I'm James. 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 Is it? Or Chuck Hunt. What's today again? It's uh, the seventh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
would love to. Yeah, I would love to. Okay, okay. Great to see you, Mark. Thank you. Great. Great. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah, that sort of thing, it does happen. It's happened to me also. And you, sometimes you don't know why, and sometimes they tell you why. Oh, right. Okay. Nice to meet you. I'm in Beijing. I'm in Beijing. Oh, great. Wonderful. Okay, great. Hi, Nihal. Okay, nice to meet you. Right, oh, great. Okay, good. Nice to meet you. Okay. Yeah. Another question I have is, I knew we're present now, the quality of the cards are a lot better. Yeah. Is there a series of information about this? Thank you. Like, you can't understand. Right. Like, the orders are given, but they turn in, you know, it's sorted or something. Right. 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 But, um, one year, exactly one year. Sometimes it's a crisis. One year, right? February 2011, and there was a announcement. Oh, yeah. It said, you were no longer supposed to post.